Next up um, is Dr. Emma Parry, who is Professor of Human Resource Management at Cranfield School of Management. Um, Emma is, is here to reinforce the importance of these kind of events and talk about some of the research that's been conducted. So Emma, I'll hand over to you now um, and hopefully we have some time for questions at the end. Okay, thanks very much, Esme. And I would just like to echo some of the comments about Sue's speech. What an inspiring speech as someone that suffered from imposter syndrome for most of my 19 years in academia um, and was told not to worry if I didn't get the job both at promotion to professor and at my head of department role. Um, I really, really understand what you're talking about. It really resonated with me. So thank you, Sue. Um, so I've been asked to come along and talk a little bit more about the research that Laura mentioned in her welcome. Um, Laura's given you a good flavour, I think, and in the time that we have today, all I'm going to do is give you a bit more of a flavour, a deeper flavour, if you like, but just to say that please do get in touch with me or read the report if you do want more details of this work um, after today. Uh, I'm going to have to do the next slide thing. Sorry, Esme, can I have the next slide, please? It's become such a cliche after the last year, hasn't it? Uh, okay. <laughs> So this is the work that we were um, asked to do. Um, this is a piece of work that, as Laura said, was sponsored by Forces in Mind Trust. Um, and we did this work with the Institute for Employment Studies. Um, so these are the questions. I'm not going to read through all of these, but really the rationale behind this work was the fact that we know that female service leavers tend to be statistically less economically active, so less likely to be in work. Um, and less likely to have successful employment outcomes than male service leavers. So what we wanted to do here really was to do some work that had more of a deep dive into what the factors are that affect those employment outcomes, how the transitions managed out of the armed forces into civilian employment and how that can be done better. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so I said who this was undertaken by. I'm not going to give you lots and lots of details about the methodology because I want to get into some highlights of the findings. Um, but just to say, really, that we drew on lots and lots of different sources of evidence here. Um, we spent some time obviously building on past evidence. Uh, we looked at secondary data. Uh, so, so these big national surveys like the Labour Force survey. Um, so we could look at careers and work in females, service leavers and female service leavers. Um, and then we undertook some interviews with employers, a survey of female service leavers and interviews with um, some female service leavers to try and get at the depth. And I feel like with my slides, I should apologise to the female service leavers and veterans in the room for the fact that I've abbreviated you to FSL throughout the, all of this presentation. Um, that really is just for aesthetics on the slide. So please do take my apologies for that. Uh, next slide, please, Esme. Okay, so let's dive straight into some of the data and I'll ap apologize here again um, for the whiz through this presentation. Um, okay, so um, we know from looking at this secondary data that if we look at women generally, so not looking at service leavers at the moment, that the economic activity of working age women generally is lower than it is from men. Um, although this gap between men and, men and women is sh shrinking. So it has shrunk from 14% in 2004 to only 10% when we did this research in 2017. What I would say though is after the events of the last year, I think because we know that the kind of occupations that women typically go into, those in hospitality, retail, um, and so on and so forth have been hardest hit um, by the pandemic um, and the impact of the pandemic, I, my fear is that we're likely to see that gap potentially shrink again, unfortunately, in the next year. Um, we know also that there's more economic inactivity in female service leavers compared to male service leavers. Um, but actually, um, if we look at the employment rates between female service leavers and female non-service leavers, uh, actually the employment rates are similar. So one question that we wanted to ask at the outset of this is, well, actually, you know, are the differences broadly in line with the differences between men and women, or is there something happening here that's specific to female service leavers and veterans? Um, and of course, the fact that the employment rates are similar doesn't mean that female service leavers don't experience specific challenges. Um, and as um, Laura said at the beginning, actually, that's what we found when we moved forward. So if we look at the next slide, please, Esme. 
Uh, OK, so let's move on to think about the factors affecting employment outcomes. And this is really the data that came from both the survey and the interviews. Um, and not surprisingly, we um, I think we found that women tend to leave the armed forces for very similar reasons to other service leavers. Um, so these are things like work life balance, job satisfaction, uh, perceived quality of management or leadership within the armed forces. So a belief that that will be better in the outside and also a belief that they have better future opportunities outside of defense. Um, this is not news. Uh, armed forces continuous attitude surveys have found similar findings for quite a long time now. Um, but it's important to think that these are the reasons I think that people leave. Uh, interestingly, if we look at the literature and a lot of evidence, um, we know that generally women experience different barriers to men in relation to their careers. And these are mostly related to things around caring responsibilities and their career trajectories after childbirth. Uh, this is no different in female service leavers. And actually what we do know as well is that female service leavers, many of them tend to leave the armed forces um, be, to go and have a family. And we know that because of the point of their careers or the point of their lives that they leave and because of the feedback in leavers surveys and so on. Um, but generally, you know, we know that women do suffer career-wise after childbirth and the activity rate is not surprisingly lowest for people that have young children and that have three or more children. Uh, moving on to talk about service leavers in particular. Uh, can we go back a slide? Sorry, <laughs> sorry, I haven't quite finished yet. Uh, just to say, I guess that finding a suitable job is the greatest challenge of transition for female service leavers. Um, and I think a really telling statistic here is that 68%, so more than two thirds of female service leavers who are not in employment when they, when they filled in our survey said that they wanted to be so. So there's something going on here that female service leavers and veterans are actually not managing to find employment when they want to. And as Laura said at the beginning, this is really because of this double whammy. So there aren't unique challenges, if you like, that female service leavers experience, but they do experience both the challenges experienced by service leavers generally, and also the challenges experienced by women in the labor market generally. And this means that they have that double whammy. Okay, next, please. Uh, so just to talk about employer attitudes, um, I think it's important to say here is that there are very few organizations that really track employment of service leavers, whether they're male or female. So it's quite difficult to monitor the experiences of service leavers generally or the progress that they make in their careers and in organizations. And we found this in previous pieces of work as well as the piece of work that I'm talking about now. Uh, as Laura said, employers are overwhelmingly generally favorably disposed to recruiting female service leavers. Now, to some degree, this could be because the employers that we talked to that volunteered to take part in this study were the ones that were positive. But again, mostly when we talk to people, they are quite favorably disposed to recruiting female service leavers. And they talk about things like work ethic, self-discipline, self-motivation, resilience, adaptability, and communication skills. Uh, on the flip side of this, and something that again we hear time and time again in research, is that there are some reservations around service leavers and their commercial and market experience. So can they really work in commercial roles in commercial organisations having left the armed forces? Um, and also um, this fear that they will find it hard to adapt to less structured environments. Um, I have to say my experience is that this is not necessarily true. It's the perception of employers that actually people coming out of the very structured environment in the armed forces will struggle in a less structured environment in organizations. And employers did talk about female service leavers in particular, having skills in things like forward planning, pulling evidence together uh, and administration compared to male service leavers. But it's important to realize that this is probably individuals within organizations talking about individual female service leavers that they know. So this is quite anecdotal at this level. Next slide, please, Esme. Okay, and just a few quotes here just to illustrate, I guess, and add a bit of flavor or warmth to what I was just saying. Um, so a couple of quotes there that really talk about the positive size, you know, Service leavers have skills that are invaluable, helps, our, helps us to ensure our future pipeline. Um, qualities that make up a good service person can add to any organization. 
Um, and I think interestingly, this comment from one of our employer interviewees, none of our problem people are ex-military. So this acceptance that actually, you know, the problems within organizations, um, as an HR person, I cringe slightly at thinking about any people being problem people, but this comment is still quite telling, I think, of um, employers' experiences. We can move on, please, Esme. Okay, so let's move on to thinking about experiences of finding work. And I'm hoping that some of these, well, I'm hoping that they don't, but I'm expecting that some of these experiences may resonate with some of you in the, um, in the conference today. So generally, one of the questions we asked in the survey was whether female service leavers thought their personal experiences of finding employment had been easier, the same or more difficult than male service leavers other females that weren't service leavers and civilians generally, regardless of gender. Um, and actually, overwhelmingly female service leavers said that their experiences of finding employment were more difficult than any of those three other three groups. So actually they felt that they did have specific challenges and more problems than male service leavers or civilians um, in finding employment. Both employers and service leavers themselves said interestingly that female service leavers undervalue themselves and are reluctant to apply for positions and I think this feeds back very well to what Sue was just saying you know around the fact that people generally um, that female service leavers are often you know reluctant to apply for positions because they don't believe that they're good enough um, so Sue's you are better than you think you are comment is an important one to reinforce here and actually we see that in women in general this is not unique to service leavers we see that generally that there's a lot of evidence out there that suggests that actually women are reluctant to apply for positions unless they feel they tick every box several times over uh, whereas men are much more likely to take a punt when they feel they have some of the skills needed for a job and that means that women typically don't apply uh, apply um, something we hear on over and over again is this difficulty in translating military skills and experience to the civilian world. Um, I know from other work that I've done that the MOD have been doing a lot of work in this area. It still is a challenge. Um, employers still really struggle to understand the relevance and application of military skills and experience within their organisations um, and individual service leavers struggle to explain that. Uh, we did see some employers that had actually created systems to address this. Um, so PwC have military insight days. Barclays runs CV and interview skills workshops for veterans to help them do that translation process. Um, and one that I felt duty bound to mention here um, is that others are other organisations have joined military networks or worked with organisations like the Officers Association um, to help them attract and support veterans. Um, interestingly, some and worryingly, I think some female service leavers did report comments such as you're too military or you need to be more feminine that they received during the application process. And I'm going to talk a little bit about discrimination and their experiences of discrimination in just a minute. But this for me is some, one of the most worrying things in this research because it does suggest a level of unconscious bias and almost open discrimination against veterans in the recruitment process. Next slide, please, Esme. Okay, so just quickly to talk about management and support of transition, um, we asked individuals about both um, management and support of transition by the MOD, so through processes um, such as CTP and others, um, but also from support by employers once they've entered work. Um, it's, fair, it's fair to say, I think, that experiences vary dramatically. Um, so, um, you know, so some people did say that they'd had quite positive experiences, others had felt that it was a disaster. Uh, again, this has been very true in all of the research on transition that I've done with some colleagues of mine. Um, and I think it's fair to say that it differs to some degree by level and rank. So people that are more senior in the armed forces do seem to get better support, I'm afraid to say. Um, but there is a lot of differences there. Um, only a minority of female service leavers felt that they'd had enough support. And importantly here, they felt that this hadn't been tailored to their needs as females. So one thing that came up repeatedly was the need to find flexible workplaces, you know, workplaces that were supportive of flexible working, 
um, and they felt that that wasn't supported in the transition process and that actually they weren't really encouraged in the directions of industries such as banking, for example, that might be supportive, um, you know, that are known to be supportive in relation to flexibility. Uh, once in organisations, though, most employers felt that uh, female service leavers didn't need additional support. Um, of course, as I said earlier, they don't monitor them. So this is again anecdotal, um, but they felt that they didn't really need additional support once in the organisation. Although there was a comment from both service leavers and from employers that female service leavers might lack confidence in adapting to civilian work compared to male service leavers. And again, I'm going to steal Sue's line again. This again, for me, links back to this idea of you're better than you think you are. Because my experience, both anecdotally and in research, um, is that women generally, but particularly female service leavers, do lack confidence. And confidence is actually a real challenge. Um, and that perhaps the transition process could do more actually around confidence and confidence and self-efficacy building um, as part of that development. Um, and I'm going to talk about discrimination now because some female service leavers did report discrimination and you'll see that in my next slide, either because they were service leavers, because they were female or sometimes both. Uh, next slide, please, Esmo. Okay, so we asked two questions here. Um, we asked, did you... Did you experience any discrimination while job hunting? And then we also asked, did you experience any discrimination uh, once you were employed? Um, and you'll see here that while job hunting, around a third of our survey respondents said that they had received some discrimination. So a really high proportion there, actually. Um, and mostly for being a service leaver. So again, 27% said they'd experienced discrimination for being a service leaver, 15% for being a woman, um, and then still quite a sizable proportion, I think 11% had, had experienced discrimination for a combination of being a woman and a service leaver. So there's really something going on here in relation to female service leavers and their experiences um, and how they've been treated in the recruitment process. And I have an example of this on the next slide. Um, next slide, thank you. Um, which I think is really interesting. So this is one of our interviewees um, who was an ex-female officer, uh, and she said, you know, first, people don't believe I've served because you don't look like an army officer. Then I'm probably 10 times more confident than a lot of civilian women, and that puts people off. Then the huge variety of skills that I have because of army service means I'm overqualified for most jobs in my area. And then fourth, I've been told by a civilian consultant that people don't want to work with ex-military because they assume they'll be bossed about and shouted at. The civilian perception of what military people are is very skewed to a dad's army image. Uh, I chose this quote because it's very illustrative of the kind of quotes that I've seen and, and anecdotally in conversations with female service leavers. And it does illustrate, I think, nicely this double whammy that female service leavers experience because this is discrimination on a number of different levels for this individual. Next slide, please, Esme. Uh, we also asked people about um, discrimination on the job. Uh, a bit lower here, as you might expect, because you might expect that veterans tend to enter organisations uh, that perhaps have a culture that is supportive of them. Uh, still around a quarter, though, that it experienced some discrimination. Uh, roughly equal levels that had either experienced discrimination for being a woman or for being a woman. Um, but then again, 8%, so a bit lower, but still quite a chunk, I think, that had experienced discrimination for a combination of the two. Uh, again, for me, these levels are still quite worrying. Uh, you know, they're still too high. So this is obviously something that needs to be addressed. And if we move on to the next slide, please. Then again, uh, an example here um, from one of our interviewees who said, I didn't realise what some civvies thought of soldiers, not good impressions. One employer didn't help me on my course, even though he was my course mentor, because I was ex-army and didn't have a clue about the real world. So this is obviously discrimination for being a service leaver. This didn't have a clue about the real world is something that I'm sure some of you in the room will have heard. It's something that I've heard repeatedly um, in doing this research and talking to veterans and service leavers. Um, so it is something that is pervasive, if you like, I think, in perceptions of veterans within organizations, unfortunately. 
Next slide, please, Esme. Okay, so moving on to the way forward. Um, uh, so I'm not going to go through conclusions and recommendations. I think it's important to say that this research really focused on um, recommendations for both the Ministry of Defence and for employers rather than um, recommendations for uh, service leavers themselves. Um, I think in terms of confusions, just to reiterate that the challenges that female service leavers experience are not unique because they are experienced by women and by other service leavers, but female service leavers definitely experience this double whammy because they're subject to both sets of challenges, if you like, when they move, when they move into the civilian workforce. Um, so one of the recommendations we, you know, is really about the MOD thinking about advice and supports so that's specific to female service leavers to be um, aware of this double whammy of challenges and to think about how they can find, they can be more supportive of things like finding jobs that allow flexible working. Um, the largest challenge still across all service leavers is about translating military experience for civilian work. This seems to be a perennial issue that over years of doing research um, in defence has come up over and over again and does not seem to be addressed despite some great efforts actually in the MOD. Um, so there is still a need for broader advice and support around this. Um, it's important to see that only a few employers actively recruit or support service leavers in general. Um, so there is still a need to promote the benefits of supporting service leavers, I guess. But actually, more importantly, perhaps few consider the unique needs that either service leavers or female service leavers might have. So there's a need really to work with employers to, to promote the benefits of employing female service leavers and to support them um, in recruiting and supporting female service leavers. Um, there's a whole area of stuff around tracking the experience of female service leavers. This work was made more difficult by the fact that employers don't track female service leavers or indeed service leavers within their organisations. So they can tell us that they've been recruited. Um, they can talk about anecdotal individual experience, but really they don't really do anything to think about um, to think about what their experiences are like within the workplace and to consider adopting things like mentoring and buddying generally um, to support transitions into civilian work. And these are the kind of things that organisations would do for women generally perhaps and would do for ethnic minorities and so on and so forth. And I think there's really a call here to start thinking about the veteran population um, and female veterans in particular in the same way. Uh, and then finally, and I guess the biggest issue uh, and perhaps the most shocking for me in this research, so I'm guessing it won't be to some people in the audience here, um, is that there's really a need to address stereotyping and discrimination towards service leavers, but female service leavers in particular, um, and to think about discrimination based again on the double whammy of them being female and service leavers, so the combination of the two here. And next slide, please, Esme, just to finish up. Okay, thank you. Uh, and that's just, yeah, I've just put my email on the screen here so people can, if they want to discuss the research in more details, they can get in touch with me because I am aware that that was a bit of a whistle stop tour through what's quite a complex and detailed piece of work. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, um, I'm sure you can see there's so many questions and um, messages of thanks coming through. So if you're happy, um, could we just ask one question as it's come up a couple of times? And that um, is, how do the challenges differ um, for spouses? You know, they have to explain gaps in their career and may lack current work experience. Has there been much research done um, for spouses? Uh there's not been a lot of research done, but I would agree completely that it's a significant issue. So I've done pieces of research that look at families and look at family, you know, families of uh, service personnel generally. This is an issue that comes up over and over again, but I've never actually done any research that does a deep dive into this. Um, and there's very little work out there. So I would say that there's a real need for research that I would love to do. <laughs> actually, to be honest with you, to look at that. I mean, anecdotally, um, there is a real need, I think, to think better about how we support spouses in their careers. I mean, it's something that's very complicated, but it is, a, you know, but it is something that's a real need to support them better because mm. they're an important part, actually, of the armed forces 
community and then obviously when we when when the family transitions out of the armed forces actually they have similar if not more significant issues in relation to um dialing up their careers again because of course they don't have the they have a gap on their cv rather than you know rather than 10 years in the military Mm. Um, and just so the audience is aware, all those um, with questions around kind of spouses and employment, we do have um, Recruit for Spouses speaking later on in the day. Um, so you'll hear from Helid who, who can go into um, more detail and the support that I they offer. have a much better answer than me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I mean, we, we're being inundated by questions, but unfortunately we don't have time for them all. So maybe um, next steps, Emma, obviously you've got your email address up there, but um, we have a couple of people wondering where they can find the published research um, and, and where they can um, find out a bit more. So the research is available via the Forces in Mind Trust website. Um, but if you, I'm very happy for people to contact me if they can't find that and I can send it to them directly. Um, Esme, I'm also really, really happy to answer. I, I'm, you know, I mean, I'm really, really happy if you want to send me these questions that we haven't been able to answer afterwards. So I'm really happy to answer them to you because presumably you have, con you know, you have contacts for some of these people. That would be absolutely brilliant. Thank you. So um, we are taking a record of, of all of these questions coming through so we can follow up individually um, afterwards and also introduce you into Emma um, if you missed the email address there. So thank you once again for joining us, Emma. Um, I think it, it looks as though we'll need to have you back for another session later on to go into more detail. We have so many questions, but um, enjoy the rest of your day and then thank you for joining us. Okay.